The American Civil War was the most violent and bloody war the United States has ever seen. The events that led up to the war were nothing short of terrifying. From the Compromise of 1850 to Uncle Tom's Cabin to the election of Abraham Lincoln as president, all the way through the battles at Bull Run and Gettysburg. Today you will see all of these things and more as they unfolded in the 19th century in the American Civil War triumphs and tragedies. Our tale begins in the early 19th century, a time of rapid territorial expansion and escalating tension between the North and South over the issue of slavery. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 had previously managed to maintain a delicate balance of power. This agreement, largely crafted by the astute political mind of Henry Clay, admitted Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state, keeping the balance of pro-slavery and anti-slavery states equal. But as the United States grew, so did the question of slavery in the new territories. Key figures like Stephen Douglas stepped onto the stage, navigating the political landscape with a keen eye. The Missouri Compromise had been a Band-Aid solution, but the wound of slavery was far from healed. As the United States expanded westward, the question of slavery in these new territories reignited tensions. Enter the Compromise of 1850. The Compromise of 1850, a series of five bills, was the North and South's attempt to maintain balance yet again, but this time, the stakes were higher. This pivotal legislation was made up of five distinct components, each with its own far-reaching implications. First, California was admitted as a free state, tipping the balance in the Senate towards the North. The territories of Utah and New Mexico were then given the power to decide for themselves whether to allow slavery, a concept known as popular sovereignty. This effectively nullified the Missouri Compromise, which had previously kept the balance of power between slave and free states. On top of this, the infamous Fugitive Slave Act was passed, further inflaming tensions. A hush fell over America as the Fugitive Slave Act was etched into law, a pivotal piece of the Compromise of 1850. This act, a desperate bid to maintain the fragile balance between slave and free states, demanded the return of escaped slaves, regardless of where in America they had found refuge. Imagine the plight of the runaway slave, tasting freedom for the first time, only to be ensnared again by the shackles of their past. Their fate rested in the hands of commissioners who, incentivized by the promise of double payment for each returned slave, held the scales of justice askew. Key figures danced on this political stage, their actions echoing through history. Among them, President Millard Fillmore, whose signature sealed the act into law, and Harriet Tubman, an escaped slave who became a beacon of hope, guiding others on the perilous journey to freedom. But remember, this was merely the overture to a much larger symphony of conflict. The Fugitive Slave Act was a spark, igniting a powder keg of tension that would eventually explode into the American Civil War. But this, my friends, was just the beginning of many things that happened that would contribute to the start of the Civil War in America. Amidst this turbulent time, a woman named Harriet Beecher Stowe pens a novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. A story set in the heartland of America, it presents a raw, unflinching portrait of the life of Uncle Tom, a long-suffering black slave, caught in the throes of an unforgiving system. Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author behind the work, was not just a novelist. She was a woman of strong moral convictions, a woman who found her voice in the fight against slavery. Her faith and her deep sense of justice were her guides. She wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin to expose the harsh realities of slavery, to pull back the curtain on a system that was anything but humane. When this book came out, the nation was at odds with itself. The United States was a house divided, torn between those who advocated for freedom and those who fought to uphold the chains of slavery. Stowe's novel, in all its stark honesty, was a mirror held up to society reflecting back an image too troubling to ignore. Uncle Tom's Cabin did not just sell copies, it sold an idea. 
It was a bestseller that shook the nation, stirring strong emotions, dividing public opinion, and sparking intense debates about slavery. It was a book that dared to question the status quo, that dared to dream of a world where all men were free. But perhaps the most significant impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin was its role in galvanizing the abolitionist movement. It was the spark that ignited the flame of change, a rallying cry for those who believed in a better future. This humble novel would become one of the seeds that would grow into the mighty tree of the Civil War, a conflict that would forever change the landscape of America. And so, Uncle Tom's Cabin, a simple tale of a man's struggle for dignity and freedom amidst a cruel and unjust system, became a beacon of change, a testament to the power of literature to shake the very foundations of society. Enter the Kansas-Nebraska Act, a law that would allow new territories to decide for themselves whether or not to allow slavery. This was largely thanks to Senator Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, who was instrumental in pushing for the act. But instead of soothing tensions, the act stirred the pot even further. It was a controversial decision, designed to appease the South, but it ended up throwing the North into a fury. The fallout of the act was immediate and intense. It unleashed a storm of conflict that history remembers as bleeding Kansas. Picture this, Kansas, a territory on the brink, was torn between two forces. On one side, the pro-slavery factions, on the other, the anti-slavery activists. They clashed violently, their ideologies as different as night and day. This was no mere disagreement, it was a battle for the soul of a nation. The violence in Kansas was a grim prelude to the war that was to come. As blood was being shed in Kansas, the rest of the country watched in horror. The Kansas-Nebraska Act, originally crafted to address slavery in new territories, had only succeeded in deeply dividing the nation. Violence in Kansas, a chilling tableau of this division, was a painful prelude. The act's fallout was not just political but a bloody, physical manifestation of the growing tensions over slavery. The Kansas-Nebraska Act, meant to solve the issue of slavery in new territories, ended up becoming a catalyst for the Civil War. But let's not forget the human cost of these political maneuvers. The Kansas-Nebraska Act and the ensuing bleeding Kansas conflict tore through the heartland, ripping families apart and turning neighbor against neighbor. Lives were lost, homes were destroyed, and communities were left in ruins. What was once a political debate became a very real, very personal tragedy for so many. And so, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, a political compromise, ended up being a tragic chapter in American history setting the stage for the bloodiest war on American soil. The stage was set in the Kansas Territory, a region teetering on the verge of civil war, deeply divided over the contentious issue of slavery. Two main factions emerged, the pro-slavery border ruffians from Missouri and the anti-slavery free staters. The tension was palpable, the air thick with discontent, setting the stage for an event known as the Potawatomi Massacre. Under the cloak of darkness, on the night of May 24th, an act of retribution was set in motion. Emerging from the shadows, John Brown, a fervent abolitionist, led his sons and a handful of followers, their hearts aflame with the desire for justice. Their target? A settlement of pro-slavery advocates nestled in the heart of Kansas. In the quiet of the night, their peaceful slumber was shattered by the thunderous approach of Brown and his men. One by one, five men were torn from their homes, their pleas for mercy drowned out by the righteous fury of their attackers. The night air was filled with the chilling sounds of steel meeting flesh, of lives cruelly cut short. A once peaceful night was transformed into a symphony of horror, a chilling testament to the suddenness and brutality of the event. In the stillness of the night, the Potawatomi Creek ran red, echoing the brutality of a nation divided. As dawn broke, the news of the massacre rippled across the nation, fueling the fires of division. The Potawatomi Massacre, a gruesome scene of violence in Kansas, intensified the conflict between North and South, turning the simmering disagreement over slavery into a boiling cauldron of animosity. This blood-soaked event served as a chilling prelude to the American Civil War, a conflict that would forever shape the nation's history. In the wake of the Potawatomi Massacre, the nation stood on the precipice of a war that would define its very identity. Imagine, it's 1857. You're in Washington, D.C., in the grand halls of the Supreme Court. This is no ordinary building, but the heart of justice in the United States. A monumental case is unfurling that will reverberate through history. The central figure is Dred Scott, a man born into the shackles of slavery, but has since tasted the air of free states. His masters are no longer of this world. 
and he firmly believes this should entitle him to his freedom. Opposite him stands Judge Taney, a stern unyielding man hailing from Maryland, holding the gavel as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. His decision carries a weight that could tip the scales of a nation. The tension in the room is palpable as Scott, a man desiring nothing more than his rightful freedom, awaits the verdict. But alas, the decision wasn't in Dred Scott's favor. The echo of this unjust ruling still resonates in the annals of American history. Now, this wasn't just about one man's freedom. This decision had far-reaching effects. The Supreme Court's ruling stated that Dred Scott and indeed all African Americans were not citizens. They had no right to sue. This wasn't just a blow to Scott, but to the millions of African Americans hoping for a brighter future. But the court didn't stop there. They went on to declare the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which had limited the spread of slavery, unconstitutional. This meant slavery could spread into the Western territories. Suddenly, the freedom that seemed so close was pushed further away. The North was outraged. The South, on the other hand, was emboldened. The divide between the two halves of the country grew deeper and wider. This wasn't just a court case anymore. It was a line in the sand a declaration of the nation's values. And with that, the spark is lit. The American Civil War is on the horizon. In the midst of this turmoil, there was a man named John Brown. An abolitionist at heart, Brown held a fiery spirit and a fierce determination to eradicate the chains of slavery. He believed in the equality of all men, and he was ready to fight for it. His plan? To raid Harper's Ferry, a federal armory nestled in the heart of Virginia. His intention was not just to seize the weapons, but to arm the slaves, to give them a fighting chance, to incite a rebellion that would shake the very foundations of a nation built on the backs of the enslaved. John Brown, a man of conviction, was ready to risk everything for his cause, for the freedom of the enslaved. The night of October 16, 1859, marked the beginning of an event that would shake the nation to its core. As darkness enveloped Harper's Ferry, John Brown and his men moved with a single purpose, to seize the armory and spark a slave revolt. The group of 21, armed and determined, took hostages and quickly gained control over the federal arsenal. Yet the morning brought a swift response. The local militia, joined by federal troops led by then-Colonel Robert E. Lee, surrounded the armory. A fierce battle ensued, echoing the tensions of a nation on the brink. The fight was fierce, but Brown's men were outnumbered. One by one they fell killed or scattered in the chaos. In the end, John Brown was captured, tried for treason, and sentenced to hang. But his actions, his stand against the institution of slavery, ignited a spark that would soon engulf the nation in the flames of the Civil War. As the presidential election drew near, the stakes had never been higher. The future of the Union hung in the balance. Enter Abraham Lincoln, a candidate from the newly formed Republican Party, who was against the spread of slavery. Lincoln, a man with a humble background, rose to the forefront of the political scene with his clear stance on slavery. His election was seen as a threat to the Southern way of life. It was a clash of ideologies, of economies, of ways of life. Lincoln's victory was a blow to the South, and their response was swift and decisive. The election of Abraham Lincoln was the final straw for the South in the brewing tensions between the North and South and the South would soon take matters into their own hands in a way nobody ever thought possible. The South perceived Lincoln's election as the ultimate threat to their way of life. The Southern states bristled, feeling their rights were being trampled on by the North. This feeling of resentment and fear grew into a fire of defiance. The election of Lincoln, a man who was openly against slavery, was seen as a slap in the face. It was the final straw, pushing them to a drastic decision, to secede from the Union. In the days after Abraham Lincoln's election in November 1860, a storm was brewing in the United States. Southern states seethed, particularly in South Carolina, where Senators James Chestnut Jr. and James Henry Hammond, prominent figures of their time, resigned their post within a day of each other. This was not a mere political maneuver. It was a statement, a declaration, a stark warning of the turmoil that lay ahead. With these resignations, South Carolina had fired the first salvo in a battle that was yet to come. As South Carolina's senators stepped down, Georgia was making moves of its own. On the 18th of November, Georgia passed a significant piece of legislation. This law allowed for a hefty sum of $1 million to be used to arm the state for war. 
It was a clear message, a bold declaration. Georgia was ready, willing, and able to defend its interests, regardless of the cost. This move had profound implications, setting the stage for the looming conflict. Georgia's actions signaled a readiness for conflict that was echoed throughout the South. But it wasn't just South Carolina and Georgia. The whole South was on edge. As November unfolded, the election of Abraham Lincoln stirred a hornet's nest of fear and anger. Southern states, feeling threatened, began to seriously consider secession. It was a time when uncertainty hung heavy in the air, a time when brother eyed brother with suspicion. In Mississippi, a convention was called to discuss the possibility of secession. The Lone Star State of Texas saw its governor, Sam Houston, desperately trying to keep the peace while many Texans clamored for secession. In Virginia, the Richmond Enquirer newspaper championed the cause of Southern independence, further fueling the tension. The echoes of the November resignations were still ringing in the ears of the nation, and the arming of Georgia was a stark reminder of the potential for conflict. The South was a powder keg, and November 1860 was the spark that threatened to ignite it. As November 1860 came to a close, the United States was teetering on the brink of war. Imagine it's December 20th, 1860. The air is thick with tension in Columbia, South Carolina. Inside the Baptist Church, a convention is being held. 169 delegates have gathered to make a decision that will alter the course of history. The vote is close, closer than anyone could have imagined. A unanimous decision, 169 to zero. In the room, a wave of emotions crashes over the assembly. The secessionists are jubilant, their voices ringing out in victorious cheers, yet others are gripped by a chilling fear, their minds filled with visions of the war they know is coming. This event, right here in this church, is the first step toward the American Civil War. And so, with a unanimous vote, South Carolina became the first state to secede from the Union, a decision that would forever change the course of American history. Fast forward six days to December 26th, a day of strategic moves and silent tension. Major Robert Anderson, a Union Army officer, was the man responsible for the federal installations in Charleston, South Carolina. In the cloak of night, he made a decision that would echo throughout history. He ordered his men to abandon their posts at Fort Moultrie, steering them towards Fort Sumter. The fort, situated in the heart of Charleston Harbor, held a strategic advantage over the city. Its location made it a formidable stronghold, a beacon of Union presence in the seceded state. The news of Anderson's move spread like wildfire, eliciting immediate reactions from both the North and the South. While the North applauded Anderson's audacious move, the South saw it as a provocation, a clear sign of defiance against their newly formed independence. Major Anderson's move to Fort Sumter was seen as a provocation by many in the South. Little did they know it was the calm before the storm, the final peaceful days before the start of the American Civil War. On a crisp January day in 1861, South Carolina troops made a move that would echo through history. The seizure of Fort Johnson, a strategic stronghold nestled on the banks of the Charleston Harbor, marked a bold assertion of Southern autonomy. The fort, once a symbol of unity, now stood as a testament to the deepening chasm between North and South. With the fall of Fort Johnson, the first domino had toppled, setting in motion a series of events that would lead the nation to war. As the new year dawned, the Southern states began to assert their autonomy in earnest. Georgia and Alabama, not wanting to be left out of the action, seized strategic military locations within their borders. The third day of January saw Georgia state troops take over Fort Pulaski, a fortress of significant strategic importance located on Cockspur Island. Following suit, Alabama state troops made their move on the 4th, seizing the U.S. arsenal at Mount Vernon, Alabama, a critical repository of military supplies. Meanwhile, in the capital, a clandestine meeting was taking place. On January 5th, U.S. Senators from seven southern states convened in Washington, D.C., a gathering that would shape the course of American history. These were Robert W. Barnwell of South Carolina, William K. Sebastian, and Charles B. Mitchell of Arkansas, David L. Uley and Stephen R. Mallory of Florida, John Hemphill and Louis T. Wigfall of Texas, and Judah P. Benjamin and John Slidell of Louisiana. Their agenda? To discuss secession, a drastic measure that would fracture the Union. Back in the South, the state of Florida was making its own power moves. On January 6th, the Apalachicola arsenal fell into the hands of Florida state troops, another blow to the federal stronghold in the South. The following day was one of intense deliberation as state conventions in Mississippi and Alabama convened. 
The topic on the table was the same as that discussed by the senators in D.C., secession. The South was arming itself, preparing for the inevitable conflict that loomed on the horizon. The seizures and secret meetings were more than a show of defiance. They were a clear statement of intent. The southern states were making their stand, asserting their rights and gearing up for a fight. The stage was set, the actors were in their places, and the curtain was about to rise on one of the most tumultuous periods in American history. In the nation's capital, the tension was palpable. On January 8th, Jacob Thompson, the Secretary of the Interior, handed in his resignation, a clear indication of the deep-seated divisions within the administration. His resignation was followed by a series of seismic shifts. Florida was the first to act, adopting an ordinance of secession just two days later. The dominoes continued to fall. On January 11th, Alabama followed suit, its leaders also passing an ordinance of secession. Georgia, not to be left behind, echoed these sentiments with its own ordinance on the 19th. These were not just political posturings. They were declarations of intent, a clear sign that these states were ready to break away from the Union. Each ordinance was a nail in the coffin of unity, a poignant symbol of the deepening divide. With every ordinance of secession, the Union was fracturing, the chasm between North and South widening. In a desperate bid to preserve the Union, a compromise was proposed. This was the Crittenden Compromise, named after its proposer, Senator John J. Crittenden of Kentucky. The compromise aimed to appease the southern states by protecting slavery below the 36 degree 30 parallel in all territories, present and future. It also proposed compensation to owners of fugitive slaves and a constitutional amendment to protect slavery where it already existed. However, the compromise was met with resistance. It failed to pass in the U.S. Senate on January 16th, largely due to opposition from Republicans who believed it conceded too much to the pro-slavery faction. Meanwhile, tensions escalated as federal troops occupied Fort Taylor at Key West on January 14th. Mississippi State troops seized Ship Island in the Gulf of Mississippi on January 20th, and Georgia State troops took the U.S. arsenal at Augusta on January 24th. The Crittenden Compromise was the Union's last-ditch effort to avert war, but it was too late. The South was already mobilizing, readying itself for the fight to come. As January drew to a close, one more state made the decision to secede. On the 26th, Louisiana adopted an ordinance of secession, joining the growing number of Southern states determined to break away from the Union. The speed at which these events unfolded was staggering, reflecting the deep-seated tensions that had been simmering for years. And so as the first month of 1861 ended, the stage was set for a conflict that would forever change the United States. A wave of change swept over the land as the Lone Star State adopted an ordinance of secession. A referendum was scheduled for the 23rd, leaving a cloud of uncertainty hanging over the nation. The whispers of secession stirred a disquiet that spread from dusty towns to bustling cities, igniting a tension that would soon engulf the entire country. And just like that, the Lone Star State had thrown its hat into a turbulent ring. Now, let's shift our gaze to February 4th, where delegates from the seceded states gathered. The air was thick with anticipation as representatives from Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina convened in Montgomery, Alabama. Men like Howell Cobb of Georgia, Christopher Meminger of South Carolina, and John Perkins Jr. of Louisiana were among the attendees their names forever etched in history. Their purpose? To establish a new government, a Confederate government, separate from the Union they had once belonged to. Each decision they made, each policy they discussed carried the weight of their people's future. You could almost hear the collective breath held by the Southern states as they awaited the outcome. Tensions were high, stakes were higher, and in the midst of it all, these men were tasked with shaping a nation. It was like watching a blacksmith forge a sword, every strike shaping its destiny. In the face of uncertainty, a new government was being born. Four days later, on February 8th, the Convention of Seceded States made a landmark decision. They adopted a provisional constitution, a critical step in formalizing their separation from the Union. This constitution was not just a piece of paper, it was a statement, a declaration of their shared beliefs and values. This constitution bore similarities to the U.S. Constitution but with notable changes reflecting the South's distinct identity. Most significantly, it explicitly protected the institution of slavery, the very issue that had sparked the secession movement. 
It also affirmed states' rights, a principle the South held dear. But it was more than just words and legalities. It represented a new nation, a new way of life. It was a symbol of defiance against the North, a bold declaration of independence. It was a beacon of hope for those who dreamed of a confederacy. With a constitution, the confederacy was now more than an idea. It was a reality. The very next day, the confederacy made another crucial choice. They elected Jefferson Davis, a Mississippi plantation owner, as the provisional confederate president. A former U.S. senator and secretary of war, Davis was a seasoned politician with a strong military background, making him an ideal choice to lead the newly formed confederacy. His election was a clear message of defiance to the North and a rallying point for the Southern states. Known for his staunch support of states' rights and his unwavering belief in the institution of slavery, Davis's presidency symbolized the South's fight for its way of life and its resistance to Northern influence. The election of Davis was not just a political move, but a strategic one, a maneuver designed to fortify the Confederacy's stand against the Union. Jefferson Davis, a name now etched in history, was at the helm of the Confederacy. On February 15th, the Confederacy made a desperate bid for peace. In a bold move, the newly formed Provisional Confederate Congress established a peace commission. This commission was intended to act as a diplomatic buffer, a liaison between the Confederacy and the United States, hoping to prevent the impending war. Yet despite their diplomatic overtures and negotiations, the commission struggled to gain any real traction. It was a well-intentioned but ultimately futile effort. Despite their best efforts, the winds of war were still blowing. The final week of February saw a series of events that pushed tensions to a breaking point. On the 16th, Texas state troops seized the U.S. arsenal at San Antonio, a bold act of defiance against the Union. Just two days later, the South saw the inauguration of Jefferson Davis, the provisional president of the Confederacy. On the 19th, Louisiana state troops took hold of the U.S. Postmaster's office in New Orleans, an act that further solidified the South's rejection of federal authority. Amidst this turmoil, President-elect Abraham Lincoln arrived in Washington, D.C. on the 23rd. On the same day, the people of Texas cast their votes, overwhelmingly approving a referendum to secede from the Union. As February ended, so did any hopes of a peaceful resolution. The stage was set for a war that would shape the nation forever. In the chill of March 1861, a storm was brewing in America. Over in Texas, a man named Sam Houston was being pushed out. He was the governor, a man who loved his state, but he didn't want to fight. They forced him to quit because he wouldn't join them in their fight against the Union. And so, Texas joined the fray, a new star in the Confederate constellation. Meanwhile, up in Washington, a new face was stepping into the spotlight. On the fourth day of March, a man named Abraham Lincoln took the oath as president. He was a man of peace, but he knew he might have to fight to keep his country whole. Just 11 days later, President Lincoln sat with his cabinet. They had a big decision to make. Fort Sumter down in South Carolina was running low on supplies. Should they send help? It was a risky move, but they knew they couldn't abandon their men. March of 1861 was a time of change, a time of decisions that would shape the nation. It was the calm before the storm, the quiet before the thunder of the American Civil War. April of 1861, a time of tension and turmoil in the United States. It all started on the 11th, when Confederate forces demanded the surrender of Fort Sumter. This demand, however, was not taken lightly. The Union garrison under the command of Major Robert Anderson stood defiant, refusing to yield to the Confederates. This fort, sitting at the entrance of Charleston Harbor, was a symbol of Union sovereignty in the heart of the secessionist South. The Confederates under General P.G.T. Beauregard were not about to back down. Their demand for surrender was met with a resolute no. This refusal to capitulate was a direct challenge to the newly formed Confederate States of America and their claim to sovereignty. The stage was set. Tensions were high. The Confederates, now left with no other choice, prepared for a confrontation. And so, on April 12th, the Confederate forces in Charleston bombarded Fort Sumter, marking the beginning of the American Civil War. By the 13th, the battered Fort Sumter had surrendered to the Confederate forces. This was a pivotal moment, one that signified the first major military action of the Civil War. The surrender sent shockwaves throughout the nation, stirring emotions and fueling the flames of conflict. The fall of the fort was more than just a military loss. 
It was a symbol that the Confederacy was ready to fight for its cause, to the bitter end if necessary. In the wake of this, just four days later, Virginia adopted an ordinance of secession, setting in motion a chain of events that would further divide the country. The decision wasn't taken lightly. A referendum was scheduled for May 23rd, giving the people a chance to voice their stance on this crucial matter. No longer just a war of words, the conflict had taken a decisive turn. Virginia's secession was a significant blow, further escalating the tensions in the country. On April 18th and 19th, federal troops burned the U.S. arsenal at Harper's Ferry to prevent it from falling into Confederate hands. The flames licked the sky, a beacon of desperation and defiance, but the Confederates, undeterred, managed to seize valuable military supplies when they occupied Harper's Ferry. The spoils of war were already being claimed. Meanwhile, tension was brewing in the streets of Baltimore, Maryland. The Pratt Street riot broke out, a violent manifestation of the divided sentiments that plagued the nation. The echoes of conflict reverberated far beyond the city's borders. In response to the escalating tension, President Lincoln made a decisive move on April 19th. He declared a blockade of southern ports, aiming to starve the Confederacy of resources and suppress their uprising. This blockade wasn't just a strategic maneuver, it was a clear message, a declaration of intent to preserve the Union at all costs. The blockade was a crucial move signaling the start of a long and grueling war. As April drew to a close, significant events continued to unfold. On the 21st, a pivotal moment occurred on the high seas. The USS Saratoga, a testament to the might of the Union Navy, captured the Nightingale, a notorious slave ship. This act served as a stark reminder of the deep-seated issues that were at the heart of the conflict. Meanwhile, on the ground, a significant shift was taking place within the Confederate forces. On April 22nd, Robert E. Lee, a man known for his military prowess and strategic mind, accepted command of Virginia's forces. His leadership would prove instrumental in the battles to come. In a further escalation, United States Army officers were seized as prisoners of war, underscoring the growing tensions and the reality of the impending conflict. And so, the month of April ended, setting the stage for a war that would shape the future of the United States. In the early days of May 1861, President Abraham Lincoln issued a call to arms. His appeal for volunteers to bolster the Union Army was an echo in the tense air of a nation on the brink of division. It wasn't just an announcement, it was a challenge. A challenge that stirred the pot of already simmering discontent among the states. This call to arms, made on the third day of May, marked the beginning of a series of events that would further divide the nation. Less than a week later, the first domino fell. On the 6th of May, both Arkansas and Tennessee adopted ordinances of secession. The states, no longer feeling represented by the Union, decided to part ways. Interestingly, Tennessee took an extra step scheduling a referendum for the 8th of June, giving its citizens a voice in this monumental decision. The secession movement didn't stop there. On the 20th of May, North Carolina joined the chorus of dissent, adopting its own ordinance of secession. The fabric of the United States was tearing apart at the seams, state by state. These decisions by the southern states, driven by a complex mix of economic, social, and political factors, served to escalate the already tense situation. The gulf between the North and South was widening, and the bonds that once held them together were becoming increasingly strained. With these moves, the South formally broke away from the Union, setting the stage for war. In response to the South's secession, the Union took decisive action. Mid-May found U.S. troops occupying Baltimore, Maryland. This strategic move aimed to secure key transport and communication routes, a vital piece in the Union's plan to reclaim the seceded states. Just over a week later, on May 24th, federal troops seized Alexandria, Virginia. This city, with its close proximity to the Confederate capital, was a significant gain for the Union, but victory came at a cost. The same day witnessed the tragic loss of Zouave leader Elmer Ellsworth. Ellsworth, known for his charisma and leadership, was killed in Alexandria by James W. Jackson, a fervent Confederate supporter. His death sent ripples of grief through the Union, but it also served to galvanize their resolve. These aggressive moves by the Union demonstrated their determination to maintain the unity of the nation. They were not just reacting to the South's actions, they were strategizing, planning, and most importantly, they were fighting back. Meanwhile, the Confederacy was taking steps to solidify its new identity. On the 20th of May, 
Kentucky remained neutral, standing on the fence between North and South. A day after, the Confederate Congress decided to shift their capital from Montgomery, Alabama, to the more strategic location of Richmond, Virginia. Two days later, Virginia's voters ratified their state convention's decision to secede from the Union. These strategic moves by the Confederacy marked the final steps in their separation from the Union. Picture this, it's June 1, 1861. The air hangs heavy with tension in Fairfax Courthouse, Virginia. A skirmish sparks, igniting one of the earliest conflicts of the Civil War. The strategic location of Fairfax Courthouse, a hub of transport and communication, magnifies the importance of this clash. Soldiers on both sides grapple, each vying for control. As the smoke cleared, the gravity of what just happened began to sink in. This was just the beginning. Next day news arrived. PGT Beauregard, a name that would echo in the annals of history, took command of Confederate forces in Northern Virginia. His strategic mind and military prowess would soon be put to the ultimate test. Meanwhile, the winds of change blew through the volunteer state. Tennessee, the last to join the Union and now the last to leave, approved a referendum to secede. A decision of such magnitude, it would shape the course of the Civil War. Tennessee had made its choice, casting its lot with the Confederacy. The lines were drawn. Come June 10th, a chilling wind blew over Big Bethel, Virginia. The day marked a significant engagement where Confederate forces held their ground against Union troops. The clash at Big Bethel, though small in scale, had a profound impact, bolstering the Confederates' resolve while shaking that of the Union. It was a harsh wake-up call to the North a stark reminder that their southern counterparts were no pushovers. Big Bethel had spoken, and its message was clear. This war was far from over. On June 16th, amidst the turmoil, a man named Thaddeus Lowe brought a vision of the future to Washington, D.C. Lowe, an inventive mind, showcased the potential of hot air balloons for wartime reconnaissance. His demonstration, a flight high above the Capitol, painted a new picture of warfare. He showed that the skies could be used for more than just the birds, that they could be a vantage point, a place to see the enemy from afar. High above the ground, the world looked different, and so did the war. June 17th dawned with the promise of conflict. Boonville, Missouri, and Vienna, Virginia were about to etch their names into history. In Boonville, Union forces under Brigadier General Nathaniel Lyon clashed with a Confederate brigade. This engagement was a strategic victory for the Union, securing control of the Missouri River and strengthening their hold on the state. Meanwhile, in Vienna, Virginia, a similar story unfolded. The Union's Ohio infantry faced off against a Confederate force, resulting in a Union victory that further cemented their control over Northern Virginia. These engagements, though on a smaller scale compared to the battles that would follow, held significant strategic value. They provided the Union with key footholds in both the Eastern and Western theaters of the war, shaping the course of the conflict in their favor. As the sun set on June 17th, the echoes of gunfire faded into the distance. But the memories of Boonville and Vienna would linger long after the last shot was fired. On the 5th of July, 1861, a fierce battle took place in Carthage, Missouri. The Union forces, helmed by Colonel Franz Ziegel, met head-on with the Confederate troops under Governor Claiborne Fox Jackson. The Confederates strategically triumphed, allowing Governor Jackson's troops to consolidate with the main Southern force. However, it was the Union forces who dealt the heavier blow, inflicting more casualties and claiming a tactical victory. This engagement signaled the beginning of a long and bloody conflict with no quick end in sight. Two days later on July 7th, a skirmish erupted at Laurel Hill, Virginia. The Confederate forces under the command of Brigadier General Robert S. Garnett found themselves clashing with the Union troops led by Major General George B. McClellan. The Union forces claimed victory that day, marking the first time a Confederate Brigadier General was killed in the war. This triumph bolstered the Union's morale and piled on the pressure for the Confederacy. The death of General Garnett was a significant blow to the Confederacy. Four days later, on July 11th, another battle raged at Rich Mountain, Virginia. The Union forces, under the strategic command of Major General George B. McClellan, squared off against the Confederate troops, led by the determined Lieutenant Colonel John Pegram. The Union forces won the day, their victory further cementing their grip on the region and setting the stage for West Virginia's eventual separation from Virginia. Rich Mountain was a turning point that tilted the balance of power in the Union's favor. On July 18th, the war moved to Blackburn's Ford, Virginia. Here, the Union forces, 
led by the determined Brigadier General Irvin McDowell, found themselves face to face with the Confederate forces, commanded by the formidable Brigadier General James Longstreet. The Confederates claimed victory that day, a triumph that served as the overture to the larger looming First Battle of Bull Run. The success at Blackburn's Ford bolstered the confidence of the Confederacy and set the stage for the First Battle of Bull Run. In the state of Virginia, near a quiet stream known as Bull Run, a battle is brewing. Here, Union and Confederate forces stand on the precipice of conflict, their tension palpable. Leading the Union, General Irvin McDowell, a man of strategy and determination. For the Confederacy, Generals Joseph E. Johnston and P.G.T. Beauregard, both formidable in their own right. As dawn broke, the air was filled with anticipation. Both sides prepared for a battle that would mark a turning point in the Civil War. As the first light of day hit the battlefield, the clash of the Union and Confederate forces began. In the heart of Virginia, strategic maneuvers unfolded. General McDowell led his approximately 35,000 Union troops with a flanking strategy, while the Confederates, 20,000 strong under General Beauregard, held their ground. The air was thick with tension and anticipation, each side delivering blow after blow in a dance of war. The battle raged on, the outcome uncertain as men fought and fell on the fields of Manassas. When the dust finally settled, the landscape was forever changed. The Confederate forces had emerged victorious, their triumph echoing throughout the South. This victory, their first major one, bolstered their resolve and sent a clear message. The South was ready to fight for its cause. The cost, however, was steep. The battlefield was a grim sight, strewn with the bodies of approximately 2,700 Union soldiers and about 1,500 Confederates. These were men who had marched into battle, fueled by a sense of duty and patriotism, only to fall in the fields of Manassas, Virginia. This battle, the first battle of Bull Run, was a pivotal moment in the Civil War. It set the stage for the bloody conflicts to come, and it shaped the public's perception of what the war would entail. A long, brutal struggle. It's July 26, 1861. The American Civil War is in full swing and federal forces make a strategic decision to evacuate Fort Fillmore in the New Mexico Territory. Perched like a watchful hawk, Fort Fillmore's strategic location was its lifeline and its curse. Its evacuation not only shook the morale of the federal forces but also offered a strategic advantage to the Confederates. So, with a heavy heart, the federal forces abandoned Fort Fillmore, not knowing what the future holds. Fast forward a day. It's July 27th. Union Major Isaac Lynn finds himself in a tight spot at San Augustine Springs. Surrounded, outmaneuvered, and overwhelmed by Confederate forces, the situation was dire. This strategic choke point, crucial to the Union's plans, was now under threat. This unexpected turn of events bolstered the Confederates' morale, tipping the scales in their favor. The Union's loss was the Confederacy's gain. Major Lynn, with his command, surrenders, marking a significant moment in the American Civil War. On that same day, a change is afoot in the Federal Division of the Potomac. A man named George McClellan steps up to take command. Known as a Major General, McClellan brings with him a fresh approach to warfare. His strategies, a mix of caution and precision, would set a new course for the war. They would influence the battles to come, shaping the direction of the Federal Division. With Major General McClellan now at the helm, the Federal Division of the Potomac braces for a new chapter in the war. Come July 31st, a man named Ulysses S. Grant gets promoted to Brigadier General. Before, Grant was a mere colonel, yet his strategic prowess and unwavering courage were already evident. His leadership, both firm and fair, inspired respect and loyalty among his men. With his promotion, the Union saw an opportunity to leverage his strengths. They entrusted him with greater responsibilities, shaping their war strategy around his unique approach to combat. Thus, Ulysses S. Grant. In the heart of summer 1861, a man named John LaMountain ascended toward the heavens from Hampton Roads, Virginia. His vehicle of choice? A balloon. Imagine the awe as he soared above, a spectacle for all to see. Just two days later, President Lincoln was making history of his own. With a stroke of his pen, he signed into law the Revenue Act of 1861, birthing America's first national income tax. But why, you may ask, did President Lincoln create this income tax? Well, dear listeners, the nation was in the throes of the Civil War. Funds were direly needed to support the Union's cause. This tax, it was hoped, 
would fill those empty coffers. So, within a span of few days, America witnessed two significant events. One man took to the skies, while another sought to lift a nation through a new law, both leaving their unique imprints on the canvas of history. The year is 1861, August 10th. The sun rises over Wilson's Creek, Missouri, where a significant civil war battle is about to unfold. This is not just a clash of armies, but a clash of ideals, a clash that would shape the course of the war in the nation's history. On one side standing tall is Brigadier General Nathaniel Lyon, leading the Union forces. On the other side we have Major General Sterling Price and Brigadier General Ben McCulloch commanding the Confederate forces. The stage is set, the tension palpable. The Union forces, about 5,400 in number, stand ready to face a Confederate force that's double their size, a formidable 12,000 strong. A daunting task indeed. Yet undeterred by the overwhelming odds, Brigadier General Lyon, a man known for his courage and tenacity, led the Union forces into battle, despite being outnumbered. The battle raged on for six long, grueling hours. The air was heavy with the acrid scent of gunpowder and the anguished cries of the fallen. The toll was severe. Over a thousand Union soldiers and an almost equal number of Confederates were killed, wounded, or went missing. Among the casualties was General Nathaniel Lyon, a brave leader and the first Union general to be killed in the Civil War. With the fall of General Lyon, the Union forces were left leaderless on the battlefield. In the end, the Battle of Wilson's Creek was claimed by the Confederates. Their victory sparked a surge of Southern morale, securing southwestern Missouri for their cause. But the cost was high. The Union mourned the loss of their lion-hearted leader, General Lyon. His death was a significant blow, a wound felt deep within the Union's ranks. The Battle of Wilson's Creek, a bloody day in our nation's history, ended with a Confederate cheer echoing across the sun-scorched Missouri landscape. Imagine being in Texas in the hot month of August in 1861. In the vast expanse of Big Bend country just south of Fort Davis, a surprise attack unfolded. The Mescalero Apaches, a fierce indigenous tribe, ambushed unsuspecting Confederate forces. This wasn't just a random act of rebellion, but a strategic move that shook the Confederates and the war itself. The indigenous tribes, often overlooked, played pivotal roles in the Civil War, shaping alliances and outcomes. This ambush was a surprise, changing the course of events in Texas. Two days later, near Washington, D.C., something unexpected happened. The soldiers of the 79th New York, disgruntled and disillusioned, staged a mutiny. The reasons? Poor conditions, lack of pay, and a growing sense of disillusionment with the war's progress. This wasn't just a minor setback. It was a blow to the morale of the entire Union Army, highlighting the pressing issues of discipline and morale during the Civil War. Indeed, this mutiny shook the Union Army to its core. A couple of weeks later, a significant victory was won. The Union forces skillfully captured Forts Hatteras and Clark down in North Carolina. These forts weren't just any old forts. They had a strategic importance guarding the vital shipping lanes. When the Union Army took them, it was a big win. It wasn't just about the forts, though. This victory gave a much-needed boost to the Union soldiers' morale. It was a turning point, a ray of hope in the midst of the chaos. This victory was a beacon of hope for the Union. The very next day a bold move was made. Major General John C. Fremont, without higher approval, took a stand. He issued an edict, freeing the slaves of all Confederate sympathizers in Missouri. This decision, audacious as it was, added a new layer of complexity to the war. It stirred controversy, sparked debates, and ignited passions on both sides. The ripple effect of Fremont's edict was profound, extending far beyond the borders of Missouri. Fremont's act was a daring move, one that would echo throughout the war. September 3, 1861. The quiet Kentucky town of Columbus is about to be disrupted. Confederate troops march in, their presence ending the state's neutral status. Columbus, strategically located on the Mississippi River, was a vital route for the Union. The townsfolk caught in the crossfire of a nation at war are gripped by fear and uncertainty. And just like that, the neutrality of Kentucky was broken, forever changing the course of the Civil War. Fast forward to September 5th. A quiet town in Missouri named Pappinsville is about to witness a skirmish. This minor battle, a clash between Union and Confederate forces, was fueled by the strategic importance of Missouri's railroads and rivers. The skirmish saw both sides fiercely defending their cause, but ultimately, 
it was the Union troops who gained the upper hand. This small victory, however insignificant it may appear, played a part in the larger tapestry of the conflict. Though a minor skirmish, it was a testament to the ever-growing tension of the Civil War. The very next day, on September 6, a strategic shift took place in Paducah, Kentucky. The Federal forces under the command of Ulysses S. Grant seized the town. Paducah was a key location, offering control over the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers. Its capture allowed the Union to choke off these crucial Confederate supply lines. The swift and decisive action by the Federal forces left the Confederates reeling. Paducah's seizure was a significant blow to the Confederacy, underscoring the escalating intensity of the conflict. The days that followed were filled with engagements and battles, each one leaving a mark on the face of the Civil War. The 10th of September saw a significant engagement at Carnifex Ferry in Virginia, now West Virginia. Confederate soldiers under the command of General John Floyd faced off against Union forces led by General William Rosecrans. Despite the Confederates holding a strong position, the Union forces managed to secure a strategic victory, forcing the Confederates to retreat. Meanwhile, in Lexington, Missouri, a crucial siege began on the 12th of September. Confederate General Sterling Price led his troops in an attempt to take control of the city. The city was a significant transportation hub due to its location on the Missouri River. The Confederates managed to encircle the city, beginning a siege that lasted for several days. This siege was of paramount importance as it disrupted Union supply lines, hindering their efforts in the region. In the midst of this, between the 12th and 15th of September, the Battle of Cheat Mountain unfolded in Virginia, now West Virginia. Union forces under the command of General Joseph Reynolds successfully defended against Confederate attacks. This battle marked one of the first Union victories of the war, boosting morale among Union soldiers and supporters. Each of these engagements and battles played a crucial part in shaping the course of the Civil War, leaving an indelible mark on our history. As September neared its end, the Union garrison found itself surrendering in Lexington, Kentucky. This was a significant blow, marking an unexpected twist in the unfolding drama of the Civil War. Just six days later, a skirmish erupted near Fort Thorne in the New Mexico Territory. Although far from the main theaters of war, this frontier clash underscored the far-reaching ripples of the conflict. And so, September of 1861 ended, leaving in its wake a series of events that would forever be etched in the annals of American history. This is the Battle of Greenbrier River, or Camp Bartow, in Virginia. A critical encounter in the heart of the Civil War, it shaped the conflict that changed the nation. Set in the lush valleys and mountains of what's now West Virginia, this pivotal battle unraveled on an early autumn morning. As the sun rose, the air filled with anticipation and uncertainty. This battle was about to be a critical encounter between the Union and Confederate forces. On the Confederate side, we had Brigadier General Henry R. Jackson leading about 1,800 men. On the Union side, Brigadier General Joseph J. Reynolds commanded a larger force of approximately five men. Jackson was a legal intellect, a poet, a diplomat, and a judge who became a Brigadier General when the war started. In contrast, Reynolds was a graduate of West Point Military Academy with a rich military. The Confederate force consisted mostly of untrained farmers and laborers while the Union side deployed professional soldiers. Despite differences in numbers, the forces were evenly matched, with the Confederate troops knowing the terrain and the Union troops having superior numbers. Both commanders faced significant challenges, yet led their men with courage and determination. The Battle of Greenbrier River was a testament to the bravery and tenacity of both the Confederate and Union soldiers, a battle that would leave a lasting impact on the Civil War as a whole. The battle began early in the morning with the Union forces attacking the Confederate camp. As dawn broke on October 3, 3, 1861, the Union under General Joseph Reynolds and the Confederates led by General Henry R. Jackson faced off at Camp Bardow, strategically located along the Greenbrier River. The Union's 5,000 soldiers were up against the Confederates' 3,000, but the latter held the advantageous position on a high ridge. The Union crossed the river under Confederate fire, their relentless attack met by the Confederates' fierce resistance. Despite their larger numbers, the Union could not break through the Confederate lines. General Jackson's experience and the Confederates' strategic positioning led them to withstand the Union attack and emerge victorious. Thus, the Battle of Greenbrier River became a significant early event in the Civil War, demonstrating the soldiers' conviction and resolve. 
October 1861, was a month of significant events. On the 9th an engagement occurred on Santa Rosa Island, Florida. This battle was fierce, with both sides showing their determination and grit. Its outcome? A profound impact on the course of the war, shaping the strategies of both North and South. Then on the 12th, a marvel of engineering took to the waters. The USS St. Louis, the first ironclad in the U.S. Navy, was launched at Carondelet, Missouri. This was not just a ship, but a symbol of the technological advancement that would play a crucial role in the war. It marked a turning point, showing how innovation could change the face of battle. October 21, 1861, a fateful day in the American Civil War marked the Battle of Ball's Bluff in Leesburg, Virginia. At the helm for the Union was Colonel Edward D. Baker, while the Confederate forces rallied behind Brigadier General Nathan Shanks Evans. The stage was brimming with anticipation. Nearly 1,700 Union soldiers mirrored by just shy of 1,600 Confederates, all poised for the impending clash. As the fog of war descended, the stage was set for a fierce confrontation. As dawn broke, the first shots echoed across the battlefield. It was a fierce battle, with both sides suffering heavy casualties. The Union forces, however, bore the brunt of the conflict. Among the fallen was Union Colonel Edward Dickinson Baker, a man whose strategic missteps led not only to his demise, but also the disarray of his forces. The Confederates, on the other hand, displayed a masterful understanding of the battlefield, using the terrain to their advantage. The steep wooded bluff became their fortress, their shield against the Union onslaught. Colonel Baker's death sent shockwaves through the Union ranks. The loss of their leader, coupled with the Confederates' strategic positioning, turned the tide of the battle decisively in favor of the South. By the end of the day, the Union had lost 223 men, while the Confederates had 155 casualties. It was a day of conflict and loss, a day that would mark the course of the Civil War. The Battle of Ball's Bluff, though small in scale, had a profound impact on the Civil War. The Confederate victory sparked a surge in Southern morale, fueling a wave of increased recruitment. The Union, on the other hand, faced a critical reality check. They responded by establishing the Congressional Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, a significant move reflecting their determination to scrutinize and improve their war strategies. The Battle of Ball's Bluff, a day of great loss and strategic blunders, left an indelible mark on the course of the American Civil War. On the 24th of October, 1861, the air buzzed with electric anticipation. A monumental feat was accomplished that day as Western Union completed the first transcontinental telegraph line. A task of immense proportions, it bridged the vast expanse between the East and West Coasts, transforming communication in the throes of the Civil War. Instantaneous messaging, once a far-fetched dream, was now a reality, shrinking the enormous distances of the battlefield into mere dots on a map. In the midst of conflict, a line of unity was drawn connecting the East to the West. A day later on the 25th, Union Major Charles Zagonyi led his men into a battle that would etch their names into history. Springfield, Missouri became the stage for a display of raw courage and unwavering determination. The Union soldiers under Zagonyi's command faced the enemy with a resolve that spoke volumes about their dedication to their cause. Springfield wasn't just a city, it was a strategic stronghold. Its control could tip the balance of the war in the Western theater. And so, with each heartbeat echoing the ticking clock of history, they charged. They charged into uncertainty, into danger, but most importantly, into hope. In the face of fear, Zagoni and his men charged ahead, shifting the tide of conflict in the West. On the last day of October, a group of legislators in Missouri made a decision that would forever change the course of their state. In the small town of Neosho, these secessionist lawmakers convened and cast their votes. The tension was palpable. Missouri, a state already torn between Union and Confederate loyalties, would now officially secede from the Union. This decision didn't just draw a line in the sand. It drove a wedge deep into the heart of the state, further fracturing its people and complicating the already complex landscape of the Civil War. The repercussions of this move would echo through the years, long after the smoke of the battlefield had cleared. With a single vote, Missouri found itself on a new path one that would continue to shape its future long after the war. On the first day of November in 1861, a significant change took place in the U.S. Army. In a move that would shape the course of the American Civil War, George McClellan stepped up to the plate, 
replacing Lieutenant General Winfield Scott as General-in-Chief. But the winds of change didn't stop there. On the very next day, President Lincoln made a decisive call. He removed General John C. Fremont from his position as commander of the Department of the West. These were the first of many shifts in power that November would bring. As the calendar flipped to the 7th of November, the engagement at Belmont, Missouri, marked the beginning of a series of battles. In Belmont, Union forces clashed with Confederates in a fierce struggle that saw bullets fly and cannons roar. Just a day later, on the 8th and 9th, Ivy Mountain, Kentucky, became another battlefield. Here, the Union and Confederates locked horns once again in a grueling contest of strategy and might. These engagements were just the tip of the iceberg for the events of November. The 8th of November brought with it an international incident. The Confederate emissaries to England and France were forcibly removed from the British vessel, the RMS Trent. This event, known as the Trent Affair, was a significant diplomatic misstep. It not only strained the United States' relationship with Great Britain, but also threatened to draw the British into the Civil War on the side of the Confederacy. The Trent Affair was a diplomatic crisis that added a new dimension to the ongoing Civil War. The middle of November saw a new Confederate Secretary of War and a blockade runner from England. Judah P. Benjamin, who had been serving as Acting Secretary of War since mid-September under Jefferson Davis, was confirmed in his role on November 21st. Meanwhile, the blockade runner Fingal, purchased by the Confederates in England, sailed into Savannah on November 12th. This vessel's arrival signaled a crucial lifeline for the Confederacy, providing much-needed supplies. These events added more complexity to the already chaotic scenario. As November drew to a close, the Union began its bombardment of Fort McRee in Pensacola, Florida. This move signaled a significant escalation in the conflict and marked a pivotal point in the American Civil War. The Union's aggressive assault was a clear demonstration of their determination to regain control over the southern states. Meanwhile, in the heartland, Missouri was caught in a unique predicament. Despite never officially seceding from the Union, Missouri found itself admitted to the Confederacy on the 28th of November. This controversial decision was driven by the pro-secessionist government that had been established in Neosho by exiled Missouri lawmakers. While the Union still held control over most of Missouri, this symbolic admission to the Confederacy further muddied the waters of allegiance. And so, November of 1861 ended, leaving its indelible marks on the history of the American Civil War. The bombardment of Fort McRee and Missouri's contentious admission to the Confederacy were but two examples of the tumultuous events that shaped this pivotal period. On the 8th of December, 1861, the winds of war blew over the mid-Atlantic. The Confederate ship, the CSS Sumter, skillfully maneuvered its way to the northern merchant ship, Eben Dodge. Using a clever strategy, the Sumter seized the Dodge, shaking the morale of the North while boosting that of the Confederacy. The ship's capture was a bold play, a harrowing reminder of the Confederacy's naval prowess. Thus, the ebb and dodge fell into Confederate hands, a sign of the growing tension on the seas. The very next day, Congress decided to take a stand. December 9th marks the establishment of the Joint Committee on the Conduct of War. This committee, a brainchild of Congress, was designed with a specific purpose in mind, to oversee and direct the progress of the Civil War. From scrutinizing military strategies to monitoring the treatment of soldiers, this committee played an instrumental role in shaping the course of the war. The formation of the committee marked a significant move towards organized and strategic warfare. December wasn't just about political moves, there was fire and blood too. The middle of the month brought a disastrous fire to Charleston, South Carolina. The flames, indifferent to sides in a war, consumed homes, businesses, and lives, the toll was not just physical but emotional as well, stirring deep sorrow and heightening the sense of urgency and fear. Meanwhile, in the heartland, Dayton, Missouri experienced its own turmoil. A skirmish broke out on the 23rd, a fierce encounter that echoed the tension of the times. Shots fired, lives were lost, and the town was left in disarray. Just like the fire in Charleston, the Dayton skirmish was a stark reminder of the human cost of this conflict. These incidents, both fiery and bloody, served as cruel reminders of the escalating tensions and the brutal reality of war. Charleston burned, Dayton was in chaos, and the war was only just beginning. As the month neared its end, battles raged on and diplomatic tensions eased. The intensity of the conflict was particularly felt in the Indian Territory, now known as Oklahoma. 
There, in the rugged landscape of Chustanala, Confederate forces locked horns with Unionist Native Americans. The clash was fierce, with both sides demonstrating an unyielding determination to claim victory. This battle etched deep scars on the land and its people, leaving a lasting legacy that resonates to this day. Simultaneously across the Atlantic, a different kind of battle was being fought, one of diplomacy and negotiation. The Trent Affair, a diplomatic incident that had threatened to pull the United Kingdom into the fray, was finally resolved. The United States released the Confederate diplomats Mason and Slidell, easing the tension that had gripped both nations. The sigh of relief was palpable, as one potential path to an even wider war was successfully averted. The Battle of Chustanala left its mark, and the Trent Affair's resolution brought a sigh of relief. As December closed, the war took a toll not just on the battlefield, but also in the world of finance. On the penultimate day of the year, banks in the heart of commerce New York suspended specie payments. This move, a response to the growing financial strain of the Civil War, had far-reaching economic implications. It meant that banks could no longer convert notes into gold or silver on demand, shaking public confidence and adding a new layer of uncertainty. With the suspension of specie payments, the economic impact of the war became all too real. January 10, 1862, a crucial day in the Civil War. We find ourselves in Middle Creek, Kentucky, where an intense battle unfolds. Middle Creek's strategic location held a significant importance for both the Union and Confederate forces. The Union, led by the future President James A. Garfield, sought control and emerged victorious. This triumph wasn't just about a single battle, but a significant step towards controlling Kentucky. The Union's victory at Middle Creek, under the command of the future President, was a significant step towards controlling Kentucky. Fast forward to January 15th, a new face enters the scene, Edwin M. Stanton confirmed as U.S. Secretary of War. Stanton wasn't just any appointment, he was a strategic mastermind, a man who would shape the Union's war strategy with his unwavering commitment to victory. His influence on President Lincoln was profound, guiding him through some of the war's most critical decisions. With Stanton's appointment, the Union got a much-needed strategic mind, a man who would leave his mark on the course of the Civil War. On January 18th, we witness another pivotal moment. The Confederate Congress votes to formally organize the Confederate Territory of Arizona, this decision, steeped in strategic calculation, was an attempt to expand the Confederacy's influence and secure crucial resources. The Confederacy had its eyes set on the gold and silver mines in Arizona. They believed these resources could bolster their economy, enabling them to better sustain the war effort. Moreover, Arizona served as a vital link to the Pacific Ocean, which the Confederacy hoped to utilize for trade and potential alliances. However, this decision, although strategic, did not pan out as the Confederacy had hoped. Despite their best efforts, they struggled to maintain control of the territory due to Union pushback and logistical challenges. The vastness of the West proved too difficult to tame. The decision to form the Confederate territory of Arizona was a bold move. Yet, the Confederacy's dreams of controlling the West would remain just that, dreams. Y'all, imagine the cold winter of January 19, 1862. We're in Logan's Crossroads, Kentucky, right in the heart of the American Civil War. This quiet corner of the world was about to witness a battle of immense significance, a battle that would change the course of the war. The Battle of Mill Springs, also known as the Battle of Logan's Crossroads, was fought between approximately 4,400 Union soldiers under the command of Brigadier General George H. Thomas and nearly 5,900 Confederate soldiers led by Major General George B. Crittenden each side resolute and determined, ready to fight for their cause. As dawn broke, the Confederate soldiers launched a surprise attack on their Union counterparts. The air was thick with the sounds of gunfire and the cries of soldiers. The ground, once blanketed in fresh winter snow, became a muddy, trampled battleground. The battle was fierce and the conditions harsh, but when the smoke cleared, it was the Union who emerged as the victors. The cost was high, though with 262 Union soldiers and 533 Confederate soldiers left on the battlefield, casualties of the brutal combat. But the Battle of Mill Springs was more than just a tally of losses and victories. It marked a significant shift in the Civil War. It was the first major victory for the Union, a much-needed boost to their morale. It also meant that the Confederates were driven out of Kentucky, giving the Union control of this strategic region. 
This battle, fought in the cold Kentucky winter, was a turning point. It changed the momentum of the war, setting the stage for the Union's eventual victory. The Battle of Mill Springs, friends, was more than just a clash of soldiers. It was a turning point in the Civil War, a moment that shifted the tide and changed the course of history. Imagine a cold winter day, January 22, 1862, in the midst of the American Civil War. The USS Lexington, a formidable Union ironclad, is poised on the Tennessee River, its sights set on Fort Henry. Under the command of Lieutenant James W. Shirk, the Lexington begins its relentless assault. For several hours the bombardment roars on, shaking the very foundations of the fort. Confederate forces under the lead of Brigadier General Lloyd Tillman find themselves vastly outnumbered and outgunned. The fort, overwhelmed by the sheer power of the Union assault, quickly surrenders. This marks a significant victory for the Union, a beacon of hope in the brutal war. The fall of Fort Henry opened up the Tennessee River to Union gunboats and supply lines, a turning point in the war. Fast forward eight days to January 30, 1862. In the bustling shipyards of Greenpoint, New York, a new kind of warship is being launched. The USS Monitor, the first ironclad warship commissioned by the Union Navy, boldly makes its debut. This isn't your average ship. The Monitor is a marvel of naval technology, unlike any ship before boasting a revolving turret and an iron-plated hull that gleams in the winter sun. Without wasting any time, the ship immediately sets course for the south, stirring the icy waters of the East River in its wake. This iron beast is on a mission, destined to change the course of the Civil War. Its journey begins here, but its legacy will ripple through history. The USS Monitor symbolized a new era of naval warfare. Its presence in the waters of the Civil War would have profound implications on the outcome of the conflict. Imagine February 3, 1862. A peculiar offer lands on President Abraham Lincoln's desk. The King of Siam, in a grand gesture of support, offers war elephants to aid in the Civil War. Astounding, isn't it? An age-old symbol of might, these majestic creatures could have been a part of our history. Why elephants, you ask? In Siam, now Thailand, elephants were revered, seen as mighty warriors. They were an integral part of their military strategy, a sight to behold on the battlefield. But Lincoln, in his wisdom, gracefully declines the offer. He explains that America's varied terrain and advanced weaponry render these magnificent beasts less practical for the war efforts. He thanks the king for his generous offer, expressing his hope for enduring peace. It's February 6, 1862. The American Civil War rages on. Tennessee's Fort Henry is under siege. The Union strategy targets the Tennessee River, a lifeline in the conflict. Fort Henry, a Confederate stronghold, becomes their focus. The Union forces launch a fierce attack and the Confederate soldiers find themselves cornered. Ultimately, they surrender. This moment, this victory proves pivotal in the Union's Western campaign. The fall of Fort Henry paved the way for the Union's control over the Tennessee River, a critical blow to the Confederacy. A day later, on February 7th and 8th, the Battle of Roanoke Island takes place in North Carolina. The Union forces launch a well-coordinated amphibious operation, aiming to seize control of the island. Despite the Confederates' valiant defense, the Union's superior numbers and firepower lead to a decisive victory. This battle is a turning point, you see. Roanoke Island is a strategic gem, a key to controlling the North Carolina coast. With Roanoke Island under Union control, a crucial Confederate lifeline was cut off. The Union had gained a significant advantage. Two days later, on February 10th, Union forces set their sights on Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Their mission was clear, to dismantle the Confederate Mosquito Fleet. This wasn't just a group of ships, it was a symbol of the Confederates' naval strength. The Union knew that taking out this fleet would weaken the Confederates' hold on the waterways. As the Union forces approached, the Confederate ships didn't back down. They fought valiantly, their cannons echoing across the water. But the Union's firepower was too much. One by one, the Confederate ships were destroyed, their wreckage sinking into the depths of the Pasquotank River. The destruction was devastating, the once formidable Mosquito fleet reduced to nothing more than debris. This was more than just a naval defeat for the Confederacy, it was a symbolic loss, a clear indication that the Union was gaining control of the waterways. The destruction of the Mosquito fleet at Elizabeth City was another major setback for the Confederacy. The Union's control of key waterways was tightening, shifting the tide of the war in their favor. The date was February 14, 
1862, a day of love turned into a day of war, as Union ironclad gunboats launched an attack on Fort Donelson, Tennessee. Flag officer Andrew Foote led the Union's charge, bringing seven gunboats and 15,000 men into the fray. On the defensive, the Confederates, under Brigadier General John Floyd, countered with 12,000 men. The air was thick with the roar and smoke of heavy artillery fire from the Union gunboats. As the sun set on that Valentine's Day, the Union forces had established their dominance, but the Confederates were far from giving up. On February 15th, the Confederates, under the command of General Gideon Pillow, launched an all-out counterattack. The Confederates fought fiercely, their initial success fueled by the hope of breaking the Union siege, but lack of coordination fumbled their advantage, allowing the Union, led by Brigadier General Ulysses S. Grant, to hold their ground. Despite the Confederates' valiant efforts, the Union's resilience stood firm. The day ended with the Confederates pushed back to their original positions, their hopes of breaking the Union siege dashed. The decisive moment came on February 16th, when Fort Donelson finally fell into Union hands. The fort's Confederate commander, Simon Bolivar Buckner, offered terms of surrender, but the Union's leader, Ulysses S. Grant, would accept nothing less than unconditional surrender. This marked the first major victory for the Union, capturing more than 12,000 Confederate soldiers in the process. The battle was not without cost. Nearly 2,000 Union soldiers and around 1,500 Confederate men were either killed or wounded in the fight. But the victory at Fort Donelson was a major morale booster for the North and opened up Tennessee for a full-scale Union invasion. The fall of Fort Donelson marked a turning point in the American Civil War, a significant victory for the Union and a crushing defeat for the Confederacy. It was here that Ulysses S. Grant earned his nickname, Unconditional Surrender Grant. Now imagine, it's February 20th, 1862, we're in New Mexico territory at the Battle of Valverde. The air was thick with tension as Union and Confederate forces locked horns. Both sides employed cunning strategies and bold tactics, their bravery and courage evident in every move. The soldiers fought relentlessly, their resolve unwavering despite the harsh desert terrain. After two days of fierce combat, the dust finally settled on the battlefield. And so, the Battle of Valverde ended on February 21st with the Confederate flag flying high. Move forward a day to February 22nd. Jefferson Davis is inaugurated as the President of the Confederate States of America. His leadership steers the Confederacy's war strategy, shaping the course of this great conflict. With Jefferson Davis at the helm, the Confederacy is now officially a nation at war. Now it's February 23rd. The Federal troops are making moves. They occupy Fayetteville, Arkansas. This town, vital for Confederate supplies now in Union hands, severely hampers the South's war efforts. The occupation of Fayetteville marks a turning point, disrupting the Confederates' plans. Two days later, on February 25th, Federal troops occupy Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville was no ordinary city. It was a vital nerve center for the Confederacy, a critical transportation hub and manufacturing powerhouse. Its railways and river systems were lifelines transporting soldiers, supplies, and hope to Confederate forces spread across the South. Nashville was more than a city. It was a symbol of Southern resilience, a testament to Confederate determination. But as Federal forces marched through its streets, the symbol crumbled. The Confederacy was dealt a crippling blow. The loss of Nashville was a wound that cut deep, severing crucial supply lines and dispersing a cloud of despair over the Confederate ranks. It wasn't just about the bricks, the mortar, or the railroads. It was about the spirit of the Confederacy, the Southern will, the resolve that had fueled the war thus far. The fall of Nashville to Federal forces was a significant setback for the Confederacy, shaking its very foundations. In early March of 1862, the Union Army made a critical move. They arrived at New Madrid, Missouri. This strategic location was a key in controlling the mighty Mississippi River. By capturing this town, the Union Army was one step closer to splitting the Confederacy in two. Just a few days later, on March 6, President Abraham Lincoln made a bold request to Congress. He asked for funds to help states that were willing to begin the slow process of ending slavery. This was a monumental moment. It signaled the start of a journey that would eventually lead to freedom for millions of people. These two events, occurring within days of each other, significantly influenced the course and outcome of the American Civil War. 
The Union's capture of New Madrid weakened the Confederacy's hold, while Lincoln's plea to Congress set the stage for the abolishment of slavery. A cold morning on March 7, 1862 in Arkansas, marked the beginning of a fierce two-day battle, known as the Battle of Pea Ridge, or Elkhorn Tavern. This was a monumental clash during the Civil War, with two determined leaders at the helm. On one side, Union's Brigadier General Samuel R. Curtis, and on the other, Confederate's Major General Earl Van Dorn. Curtis had under his command a force of about 10,500 dedicated men, while Van Dorn led a slightly larger force an estimated 16,000 Confederate troops. Their strategies were as different as their armies. Curtis, understanding the strength of his position, formed a defensive line prepared to withstand the storm. Van Dorn, however, had a different plan. He launched a surprise attack, hoping to catch his enemy off guard. As the first day of battle ended, the Union forces held their ground, preparing for the fight that would continue the next day. As dawn broke on March 8, the sounds of gunfire filled the air once more. The Union forces, led by Brigadier General Samuel R. Curtis, launched a determined counterattack, pushing the Confederate troops back. The Confederates, under the command of Major General Earl Van Dorn, found themselves in a dire situation and were eventually forced to retreat. The cost of this two-day clash was immense. The Union forces suffered around 1,384 casualties. On the other side, the Confederates saw approximately 2,000 of their men dead or wounded. The Battle of Pea Ridge was not just another skirmish in the history books, it was a decisive victory for the Union that helped maintain control over Missouri, a strategic stronghold in the Western theater of the American Civil War. The Battle of Pea Ridge, a significant victory for the Union, proved pivotal in the Western theater of the American Civil War. And even today, it remains a testament to the courage and sacrifice of those who fought on that fateful ground. March 8, 1862, painted a grim picture of destruction as the CSS Virginia, a fearsome ironclad, bore down on the wooden-hulled USS Cumberland and USS Congress. It was a spectacle of raw power as the Confederate's iron beast, the CSS Virginia, tore through the Union's wooden vessels. The USS Cumberland and USS Congress were no match for the ironclad's formidable strength. Like a hot knife through butter, the Virginia ripped through the hulls of the Union ships, sending them to a watery grave. The Union Navy watched in horror, their hearts filled with dread at the sight of this new form of warfare. The once mighty wooden warships were reduced to splinters in the face of the ironclad. The CSS Virginia with its iron scales seemed invincible, leaving a trail of ruin in its wake. Yet, come March 9th, another beast of steel, the USS Monitor, challenged the CSS Virginia at Hampton Roads, Virginia. A clash of titans ensued, the first of its kind in history. The Monitor, a nimble Union vessel, faced off against the Virginia, a Confederate behemoth. They traded blows, iron against iron, their cannons roaring, filling the air with smoke and the deafening echo of battle. Yet despite the furious engagement, neither ship could land a decisive blow. The Monitor's turret was too low, the Virginia's armor too thick. The day ended with both ships still afloat, a stalemate that marked a turning point in naval warfare. The Battle of Hampton Roads ended in a draw, but it forever changed the face of naval warfare. On March 11th, a change swept through the Federal armies. President Lincoln relieved General McClellan of his command. This decision, driven by McClellan's cautiousness and slow progress, aimed to inject new vigor into the Union's military approach. The move stirred mixed feelings within the ranks, some were disheartened, others saw it as a fresh start. This strategic shuffle, however, proved pivotal. With this shift in command, the tide of the war began to change, each decision, each battle, slowly shaping the future of the nation. On the 11th day of March in the year 1862, President Lincoln made a decision that would change the course of the Civil War. A decision that would echo through the ranks of the Union Army and alter the path of a nation embroiled in conflict. General McClellan, a man known for his caution and strategic patience, was relieved from his position as General-in-Chief of the Federal Armies. This was a direct result of President Lincoln's growing frustration with McClellan's lack of aggression. The President yearned for bold moves, for decisive action, not the slow, measured pace McClellan seemed to prefer. As word of the President's decision spread, the morale of the Union Army wavered. Some were relieved, others apprehensive. This bold move had strategic implications too. It signaled a shift in Union strategy, a readiness to take the offensive, to bring the fight to the Confederates. 
And so, with a single decision, the direction of the war began to shift. Just three days later, on March 14th, the Union forces celebrated two significant victories. The first triumph was at New Bern, North Carolina, a vital seaport and railway hub for the Confederacy. Its capture disrupted Confederate supply lines, hampering their ability to wage war. The second victory of the day unfolded in New Madrid, Missouri, a strategic point along the Mississippi River. Its fall to the Union forces dealt a severe blow to the Confederacy's control of the river, cutting off a crucial transport route. These dual victories were more than just strategic wins. They were a much-needed morale boost for the Union Army and its supporters back home. Soldiers and civilians alike saw these successes as a sign that the tide of war was starting to turn in their favor. It wasn't just about gaining territory, it was about moving one step closer to the ultimate goal of preserving the Union. These victories marked a turning point in the war, symbolizing hope and progress for the Union. On March 18th, the Confederacy responded to their recent losses with a change in leadership. They appointed George W. Randolph as their new Secretary of War. Randolph was no stranger to the battlefield. He had proven his mettle during the Battle of Seven Pines, and his military acumen was widely respected within the Confederate ranks. As Secretary of War, Randolph's primary role was to breathe new life into the Confederate war effort. He was tasked with improving military logistics, enhancing training programs, and overseeing the production of vital war materials. His leadership brought a fresh perspective to the Confederate strategies, leading to a shift in the overall war dynamics. The Confederate Army, rejuvenated under Randolph's stewardship, began to show a new level of resilience and determination. With new leaders and new strategies on both sides, the war was set to enter a new and decisive phase. Imagine a crisp Sunday morning, March 23, 1862, in the heart of Virginia. The American Civil War is in full swing, and the small town of Kernstown is about to witness a pivotal battle. The town of Kernstown, Virginia, was a quiet place until it found itself at the center of a defining moment in American history. Two commanding officers, Stonewall Jackson leading the Confederate Army, and James Shields commanding the Union forces, stood at the helm of their respective armies. The Confederate force, though smaller in number with 3,400 men, had a reputation for tenacity and strategy under Jackson's leadership. On the other hand, the Union force boasted a larger number, 8,500 strong, a testament to their might and readiness for the battle ahead. As the day wore on, the battle raged fiercely. The Confederate forces, despite their numbers, initially held their ground, their resolve unyielding. However, the larger Union forces steadily began to turn the tide. The toll of this fierce confrontation was heavy on both sides. The Confederate forces suffered the loss of 718 brave men, while the Union mourned the loss of 590 of their own. Despite the odds, the Union emerged victorious from this grueling encounter. This marked the only time the indomitable Stonewall Jackson would taste defeat during the war. This unexpected outcome gave the Union forces a significant morale boost, altering the course of the war and offering a glimmer of hope amidst the despair. And so, as the smoke cleared over Kernstown, the Union celebrated a hard-fought victory, while the Confederates mourned their loss. The Battle of First Kernstown, a small yet significant chapter in the vast saga of the American Civil War, ended leaving an indelible mark on the pages of history. March 24, 1862, a day of turmoil in Cincinnati, Ohio, as an abolition meeting spirals into a violent riot. Passionate abolitionist leaders convened only to face a fierce backlash from pro-slavery sympathizers. Hundreds were caught up in the chaos, though the exact numbers remain a mystery. The riot served as a chilling reminder of the deep-seated divisions within the Union itself, further stoking the fires of tension. In the end, the Cincinnati riot underscored the ideological struggles that fueled the Civil War with no clear victor but a city left in turmoil. Two days later, on March 26, the war moved westward to the rugged terrain of Apache Canyon, New Mexico Territory. The Union forces, under the command of Colonel John P. Slough, and numbering around 1,300, clashed with the Confederate troops, led by Major Charles L. Pyron, who had about 200 men. The engagement was fierce but the Confederates were forced to retreat, suffering 32 casualties, while the Union losses stood at 21. This confrontation, though small in scale, echoed loudly through the Southwest. The engagement at Apache Canyon, 
though minor in scale, was a significant win for the Union, disrupting Confederate plans to control the Southwest. On March 28, the conflict reached a head at the Battle of Glorietta Pass. The Union forces, now marching under the keen leadership of Major John M. Chivington, pulled off a daring flanking maneuver. They engaged and successfully drove back the Confederate forces, valiantly led by Major Charles L. Pyron and Lieutenant Colonel William R. Scurry. The battle was fierce, with the Union enduring 142 casualties. The Confederates bore the brunt of the conflict, losing a significant 19 score of their men. The Battle of Glorietta Pass, often dubbed the Gettysburg of the West, dealt a crippling blow to the Confederate campaign in the New Mexico Territory, and in turn, shifted the momentum of the war back to the Union. April 1862, a month etched in the annals of American history, a time when iron and fire clashed on the mighty Mississippi. On the fourth day, a Federal ironclad gunboat dared to run the batteries at Island No. 10, a bold maneuver, a daring gamble. Commanded by Flag Officer Andrew Hull Foote, this audacious act marked a turning point in the control of the river. The very next day the Siege of Yorktown, Virginia commenced. Major General George B. McClellan, with a force of 100,000 men, faced off against the Confederate Army of 60,000, led by General John B. Magruder. A month-long standoff that saw both sides suffer casualties in the thousands. The Federal victory at Island No. 10 and the inconclusive end at Yorktown played crucial roles in the grand chessboard of the American Civil War. Each move, each decision, each life lost, weaving together the complex tapestry of a nation at war with itself. Remember them, for they shape the world we live in today. As dawn broke on April 6, 1862, the quiet woods of Tennessee erupted into the Battle of Shiloh, also known as Pittsburgh Landing. Commanding the Union was Ulysses S. Grant, while Albert Sidney Johnston led the Confederates. Over 40,000 Union soldiers faced off against 55,000 Confederates. Day one saw the Confederates pushing Union forces back, but Johnston fell, mortally wounded. General Beauregard took the reins, but the tides began to turn. On day two, Union forces rallied, driving the Confederates back. The cost was high, with the Union losing around 13,000 men, and the Confederacy, over 10,000. The Union's victory became a turning point in the Civil War. It cracked open the Western Confederacy, setting the stage for the Union's eventual triumph. The Battle of Shiloh, a grim testament to the price of war, forever changed the course of our history. In the heart of April 1862, a dance of power and struggle unfolded. On the eighth day, two significant events marked the course of the American Civil War. The Battle of Fallen Timbers roared with the clash of arms, under the watchful eyes of commanding officers, their men standing strong. On the same day, Island No. 10 fell to Union forces, led by the stoic Major General John Pope. Congress, not to be outdone, passed a resolution on the 10th of April, spearheaded by President Lincoln. This resolution offered financial aid to states willing to start the slow but necessary process of abolishing slavery. Each battle, each decision, carried weight. Lives were lost and victories were claimed. The toll of men, the count of casualties, these were the prices paid for each step toward the end of the war. Each victory, each loss, shaped the future of a nation on the brink. In the echoes of the past, we find the whispers of those who fought, those who led, and those who dared to dream of change. This is the tale of April, 1860. In the cool spring of 1862, the American Civil War was in full swing. A crucial battle unfolded at Fort Pulaski a fortress of stone and mortar on the Georgia coast. The Union, led by Captain Quincy Gilmore, had their sights set on this southern stronghold. On April 10th, Gilmore and his 7,000 men unleashed a barrage of gunfire on the Confederate-occupied fort. The South, under the command of Colonel Charles Olmsted, fought back with a force of 480 men. The air was filled with the roar of cannons and the cries of men, but the Union had a secret weapon, rifled artillery, these cannons could hit their target from a distance, and the walls of Fort Pulaski were no match for them. By the next morning, the damage was severe. Olmsted, seeing the futility of further resistance, raised the white flag. The Confederates suffered only one death and a handful of injuries, while the Union lost none. 
This Union victory was a turning point. It proved that no fort was safe from the rifled artillery, changing warfare strategies. The surrender of Fort Pulaski, a symbol of Southern strength, was a blow to the Confederacy, signaling the beginning of the end for the rebel cause. As the echoes of gunfire faded, the hush of surrender fell over Fort Pulaski. The battle was over. The war, however, raged on, 